Hello and welcome to ATP Report. I'm Barry Newsbaum. We are so honored and thrilled to have back with us today, Daniel Greenfeld. As you know, Daniel is an esteemed and well-known columnist, writer. He's the Shulman Scholar at the David Horowitz Freedom Center, and he is the expert on all things political. Welcome back, Daniel. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. So there's a a really bad announcement, I don't know how else to say it, to be really direct, Daniel, that President Biden, in his infinite bending over backwards to appease every possible political group in America, has appointed a, a gentleman, and I use that word in quotes, um, as a special envoy within civil rights, except this guy wouldn't know a civil right if it hit him over the forehead. Why don't you tell us who Biden picked and tell me about this guy's horrific background when it comes to some of his beliefs about Israel. So the Biden administration has some really bad appointees and then it has spectacularly bad appointees. So um, last decade, Maher Bitar was studying at Georgetown, which of course is the incubator for foreign policy. There he was one of the heads of Students for Justice in Palestine, which is a top anti-Semitic campus hate group uh, its members have been involved in physical attacks on Jews. Uh, they've been involved in disrupting Holocaust commemoration ceremonies. Uh, they've been, obviously, they are a major uh, source of BDS activism. They've invited anti-Semites to campus. And he was also one of the organizers of the 2006 Palestinian Solidarity Movement um, conference at Georgetown, which was widely condemned at the time. Uh, this guy went into uh, UNRWA. He went into various anti-Israel activist groups. And then he went right into the State Department uh, during Obama. He, uh, he climbed the ropes under Obama as one as uh, working under Samantha Power. It actually discussed at one point uh, moving troops into Israel to intervene, uh, so to speak. He rose all the way to the point where he was actually heading up the Israel-Palestine desk at the National Security Council. And the guys who have held down this desk have almost always been absolutely terrible. Uh, there was a brief exception under President Trump once McMaster was out. McMaster appointed a Hamas supporter over there. Um, anyway, just to skim over that, Biden brought him back. At this point, he's now heading um, intelligence for the National Security Council, which basically makes him the interface between the White House um, and the so-called intelligence community. It means the raw uh, stuff from the intelligence community is going through him, it's going through the White House, to the White House through him in many cases, and policy from the White House is going back to the intelligence community through him, which means he's the one telling the CIA, these are the White House's priorities. Obviously, this is really, really bad news for Israel. It's really bad news for that matter for many of our allies in the Middle East. It's bad news for American foreign policy because this guy was an enthusiastic proponent of BDS. Uh, he blamed Israel for just about everything. Uh, you can even see a photo of him from the Georgetown days dancing in front of a banner denouncing Israeli apartheid. I put that in quotes. So uh, this is about as anti-Israel as you get. And he's in a major, major position to shape foreign policy under Joe Biden. That was a wheel belt barrel full of proof as to this guy's background being so horrible. I mean, I, I was reading this morning, getting ready uh, for our show today. The uh, new Secretary of State is talking, our new Secretary of State is talking about how Israel is our best ally and we're not gonna move the embassy out of Jerusalem and security cooperation will continue and we will continue uh, with the support and expansion of the Abraham Accords that was all President Trump's doing. I mean, more was accomplished for Middle East peace in the last year and a half than in the last 50 years by all the American presidents combined. And the signal was that those policies are gonna continue. How in the world, Daniel, can the Biden administration say with a straight face, and we're gonna continue those policies by appointing a proven anti-Semitic, anti-Zionist, anti-Israel provocateur who makes no secret or no apology for his horrendous background. Uh, they're not gonna continue those policies. Whatever they might occasionally say to Jewish groups, the bottom line is they're gonna continue Obama administration policies. They've made this very clear. One, they're reopening the deal with Iran. 
Uh, two, they're reopening the PLO mission. They're reopening foreign aid to the PLO, which again, fu directly funds the murder of Israelis, of Jews. For that matter, of Americans who are not Jews, the Taylor Force Act, which is a law, um, was named after Taylor Force, who was an American veteran who just happened to be in Israel, uh, non-Jewish. So the bottom line is they're reopening um, support for terrorism. They're reopening support for Iran. As far as the Abraham Accords go, uh, they froze arms sales to uh, Sunni Arabs. And that was part of what the Abraham Accords were based on. They're breaking up this common front between the Israelis and the Sunni Arabs against Iran. So there's no expansion of this. There's no basis for any of this. And they're, they've signaled very clearly that they're making the so-called um, it, peace process between Israel and the PLO, the center of everything. And they've said, you know, just because you've got normalization between the Arabs and Israel, that's not a substitute for peace. And peace is just, in this case, pretty much going to mean, like, once again, subsidizing the terrorists, attacking Israel for building, you know, their um, assistant UN um, ambassador gave a speech before the Security Council, which said that both sides have to avoid unilateral steps. By that, he meant Israel has to avoid settlements. It has to avoid uh, Jews living in parts of the Israel that is claimed by the terrorists. And the other side, at the very end, he said, you know, they have to avoid incitement and funding terrorism, as if the two are e equivalent, as if Jews living, say, in Judea and Samaria is equivalent to the PLO funding terrorism. But that's the position that they're taking. So, and this is all consistent with all of a piece. Let me ask you a question. Um, I've never understood this, and I hate when I get asked the question because I I have an answer and I, I've never asked you this question. So I apologize if I'm putting you on this on the the spot, so to speak. But I'm Jewish and I've been asked many times on other people's shows, why don't American Jews speak up to defend against hateful people being appointed to represent the United States, especially when those people hate Jews? Why are the Jewish voices silent now? No, we're Jewish, we're not silent. But I mean, what the question really gets at is the fact that the so-called Jewish establishment, the Jewish organizational sphere, uh, consists of people who have very limited interest in Israel. You know, before Israel was created, they did absolutely nothing. In some cases, they outright sabotaged the creation of Israel. When you look at the history, uh, they poured a whole lot of money into a Soviet project to create Jewish settlement in Crimea as an alternative to Israel. Uh, when the Nazis came in, pretty much all those people were killed. Uh, they did everything possible to undermine Israel, but the bottom line is there was enthusiasm among the rank and file American Jews about Israel in the 50s and the 60s, and so they had to give in, just like when they came to Soviet Jewry, uh, they did everything to stop any kind of civil rights movement for Soviet Jews, but when the movement took off, they kind of got on board, and this is the same thing that happened with Israel, it's the same thing that happens with any Jewish issue, but the bottom line is their values are progressive values, their priorities are progressive priorities, and when you look at particularly the new generation of American Jews, and this is unfortunately an area where American Jews very much differ uh, from not only Israeli Jews, but British Jews, Canadian Jews, Australian Jews, uh, Israel just comes right at the very tail end of their priorities. Their priorities are tikkun olam. Uh, when they're asked what makes them Jewish, uh, they will respond with things like a sense of humor and God is somewhere near the bottom, also there. So the bottom line is these people are progressives, they're leftists. Uh, their priorities are um, various identity politics rights, but not Jewish rights. They absolutely don't care about Jewish rights. Um, otherwise, you know, they'd actually be taking on the entire affirmative action quota system that is keeping a whole lot of uh, Jewish, a whole generation of Jewish students out of college or out of the colleges of their choice, much as it's doing to Asian students. But again, that's a kind of a sidebar. Bottom line is the people really do not have Jewish priorities. Uh, Israel ranks very low well on their list of priorities. And really, this is a statistic I like to close with when I'm asked this on shows, usually by people who are not Jewish, and it comes from the tail end of the Obama administration. Among Jews who attend synagogue at least once a week, a majority disapproved of Obama. Among those who did not, a majority approved of him. This is the same basic split you see among Christians, among people in general. Uh, people who are somewhat more religious, more traditional, are more likely to be conservative. They're more likely to be pro-Israel much as they're more likely to support nations being able to defend themselves against Islamic terrorism in general. Those who are not support open borders, they support the destruction of countries, and this is what we're seeing. Well, I'm very sad to say that your news is true and it's horrible, and the tremendous gains that the Israel-American alliance achieved in the last four years, if you're right, Daniel, and I'm fearful you are correct, are going to unwind one at a time. To pick a guy 
who danced jubil jubilantly supporting Students for Justice in Palestine, that group might as well be students who hate Israel and want them dead. It would be the same equivalency. People that support BDS, which is uh, an avowed hate group that literally has said from their founder's mouth, I want the state of Israel eliminated from the map and makes no secret about it to this day and has never walked back those words and still affirms them when asked is horrifying. So I guess where we're going to leave it today is this guy is a horrible pick. He doesn't like Jews and doesn't like Israel. And I'm being nice because the truth is he hates them both. And now he's going to be formulating American foreign policy in regards to that country. Am I saying that correctly? You're saying that correctly. I would just add that I strongly suspect that he's not a big fan of America either. You may be right. Thanks for coming on today, Daniel. I really appreciate it. And thank you out there in ATP land. I want to remind all of you, if you haven't subscribed to our text message alert system, please do so now. Take out your cell phone, type the word truth in the message box and address it to 88202 push send. You'll be automatically subscribed for free. You'll get all of our shows and all of Daniel Greenfeld when he comes on ATP in the palm of your hand, and there's never a charge for our content. For ATP Report, I'm Barry Newsbaum.